Hey everybody, I've uh, got to uh, talk about uh, induced EMF and electric fields. Uh, if you would take a moment and pause the video and copy down the stuff that's here, uh, we have a review of Ampere's law, which I'll explain why that's up there in a, in a moment. Um, I've got the situation, which is I've got a, a circular conductor, a wire bent in a circle, and I've got a magnetic field that points into the conductor or into the page, and that's increasing, okay? Uh, I've got from a few units ago, I've got uh, the relationship between voltage and electric field. Change in voltage is negative E dot dS. And then um, off to the right down here, I've got the definition of magnetic flux. Uh, and then the version that we're going to use is BA cosine theta. And matter of fact, we're not even going to have the cosine theta in there at all because uh, theta is uh, zero degrees. The the uh, angle between the field and the area vector is zero uh, degrees. So if you need a moment, uh, go ahead and pause the video and copy all this stuff down, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, uh, we're going to start with, uh, we're going to rewrite Faraday's law, okay? Now, uh, for Faraday's law, EMF, the magnitude of it, is equal to the time derivative of the magnetic flux, okay? Um, now, I'm not gonna put the negative sign, there is a negative in there, and that's Lenz's law, and that involves direction, but we've already taken care of that in this first equation for change in voltage. And by the way, uh, these two things are the same thing in this case. So we've, we've already taken care of the direction thing once, you don't wanna do it twice, because then you're doing a double negative type thing, so you don't do that. So anyway, um, we have two equations for change in voltage. Um, now, by the way, a quick note, uh, going back to the diagram, uh, if we have an increasing magnetic field, uh, Lenz's law states that the conductor will uh, create a flux to oppose the change in magnetic flux. So the conductor will basically make a magnetic field pointing out of the page. In order to make a magnetic field pointing out of the page, you would say that current would flow clockwise, or sorry, counterclockwise around the circle, okay? Well, what makes that current flow? Well, that's an electric field, and that's kind of what we're getting to here, okay? So, you know, why does current flow when you change a magnetic flux somewhere? Well, that's because that changing magnetic flux creates an electric field, okay? And, and um, basically, to figure that out, all we're going to do is combine these two equations, okay? So, um, you, the first equation is uh, negative the integral of e dot ds, okay? And that's gonna equal uh, d magnetic flux dt, okay? Now, there's two things we have to do, uh, slight modifications for this. One is this conductor, we're doing a complete circle. So how do we modify the equation for that? Well, you put a circle uh, around your integral. That means a closed path. So what this is saying is if I integrate E dot dS around a closed path, then the, the result of that is the deflux dt. And the last thing we're going to do is move the negative sign to the other side. And what you end up with is you end up with integral closed path of E dot dS equals negative d magnetic flux dt. Okay? And this is actually Faraday's law the way he would have written it. Okay, so um, we, we've been using this version of Faraday's law. EMF is negative deflux dt, but this is this is actually what Faraday would have written. Okay, now, uh, uh, some things I want you guys to notice about that equation. I want you to look at that equation, and I want you to look at the Beals, or uh, Ampere's law. In Ampere's law, we have a closed path integral b dot ds. In Faraday's law, we have a closed loop integral of E dot dS. Okay, so that looks similar. In Ampere's law, we have two terms on the right. Um, the, the first term is what Ampere would have written. Okay, and the last term, this is what uh, Maxwell added to that. And we, we've talked about this in the past. The epsilon naught d electric flux dt, that's called displacement current. 
That's as if a current were flowing from, for instance, would say of a capacitor plate or capacitor that's charging. That would be like the rate of change of the electric field, electric flux between the plates, which is, it behaves like a current, okay? But here's the, the big picture thing that I want you guys to, to catch with these two equations. And then I do have one quick example for you, but the big picture thing is the following, okay? If we have a change in electric flux, you get a magnetic field. And that magnetic field circulates in a circle, okay? Conversely, if you have a changing magnetic flux, you get an electric field that circulates in a circle, okay? Now, if you think about this for a minute, there's, there's a couple, there's several things about this that are, that are really important to kind of think about. So uh, one is, if I have a changing electric flux, I get a magnetic field. And if I get a changing magnetic field, I get an electric field. So a changing one or the other field can generate a changing the other field, which then in turn generates the other field over again. Okay, so you get this, this effect of constantly varying electric and magnetic fields. This leads into electromagnetic waves. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. And by the way, it is no accident that the speed of light is equal to one over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. Okay, for those of you that go on and take more physics, you would, you're going to learn all about that and how these things relate to each other. Um, but try this out in your calculator if you want. Uh, if you do that, you get about three times 10 to the eighth meter per second. Okay. Um, now, uh, something else I want to mention about this version of Faraday's law in no other point have we had electric fields go in circles they've always gone like in or out of stuff so for instance if you have let's say a positive charge and a negative charge the electric field goes like this it doesn't circulate it, it has a start and an end point okay well um now we have an electric field that actually does circulate okay and that's again you get an electric field that circulates if you change a magnetic flux in a region Finally, something else I want to mention. Uh, when we talked about circuits, we talked about Kirchhoff's loop rule. So if we have, let's say, a circuit with uh, some resistors and a capacitor and stuff in it, one of the things we talked about is if you do a complete lap around this thing, oops, sorry about that. Uh, if you do a complete lap around this thing, the total change in voltage is equals zero. That's Kirchhoff's loop rule. Okay, well, if I were to start changing a magnetic flux in here, if I were to add or subtract a magnetic field, okay, strengthen or reduce a magnetic field or change the flux in some other way, then it turns out that this wouldn't equal zero anymore. So Kirchhoff's loop rule is only valid if we don't have a changing magnetic flux somewhere in the circuit. Now, in most everyday applications, like if you're doing a lab in circuits or you're creating a circuit in a computer or something, you're not going to have much of a changing magnetic flux through it. So usually, usually Kirchhoff's loop rule is valid, but there are cases when it wouldn't be if you have a changing magnetic flux. Now, the one example I have for you is, let's say I have a, a region of space, here it is, and I've got a magnetic field in that region of space, okay? And that magnetic field is changing. And let's say the magnetic field is equal to four t squared. So I'm giving you a field that changes with time. And let's say the radius of this region, I'll call it R, R1. Let's say it's uh, two centimeters. And let's say I'm looking at a point five centimeters from the center of this region. Okay. And let's say we put a proton there. All right. So let's say you are somehow isolated proton and put it there. Okay. Well, it turns out that that proton is going to experience a force. Even though the proton, there's no conductor there, it's empty space right there, the proton is going to feel a force, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to use this version of Faraday's law um, to calculate the electric field, and then we're going to calculate the force. So the two equations we need, we need that version of Faraday's law, integral, closed loop, E dot dS equals negative D magnetic flux dT, okay? 
And we also know, need to know the force on a proton. Well, that's F equals QE. Okay, so what I'm going to do is we're going we're gonna to find the electric field using uh, Faraday's law, and then we'll um, plug that in to find the, the force on a proton. Okay, so looking at, at Faraday's law, okay, the electric field that's going to get made, well, this magnetic field is increasing. Okay, so this, <laughs> this is where it gets kind of goofy. This whole region of space is going to try to make a flux pointing out of the page to counteract that increase in magnetic field. In order to make that flux pointing out of the page, you're going to get an electric field that circulates counterclockwise, just like in the previous picture we drew. So that's going to be your circular electric field. Okay. So in the left half of this, this becomes E times, well, what's the, the length of that circular path? Well, it's just 2 pi times R2. Okay. That equals, now I'm going to eliminate the negative because the negative just is about direction. And we've already covered that. We, we said our, our circle is going to be directed counterclockwise. And our proton, by the way, the force on the proton at this instant, that force will be up. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, the change in flux, well, that's only changing in this region. Okay. So uh, the area is constant. That is uh, pi times R1 squared. Um, remembering that flux is uh, B times A in this case. There's no angle to worry about here. So the area is constant is pi R squared. What's changing for the D flux DT is the B. This is equal to DB DT. So this is the area times DB DT. Okay. And what is DB DT? So if we kind of replug this stuff in, we do a little bit of algebra. Okay, so we got 2 pi r2 equals pi r1 squared. dB dt, well, b is 4t squared. So dB dt would be um, 8t, all right? So that is your derivative um, of the magnetic field as a function of time. Uh, and if we do a little bit of uh, canceling, like the pi's drop out, uh, this becomes a 4 right there. You get the electric field is um, R1 squared, uh, there's a four out front, uh, times T, okay, over R2, okay? So that's the electric field in that region of space as a function of time, okay? Finally, the force on the proton would just be Q times E. So it would be uh, Q times four times R1 squared times T over R2. So that would be the force on a proton. So that proton, when you change its magnetic flux in that circle, okay, the force on the proton would, at this moment would be directed up and it would be that magnitude, okay? Now, having said all that, uh, the proton would start moving, assuming it was free to move, it would start moving in that direction, okay? But when it got to somewhere, let's say here, well, now the force would be that way on it. So the path that the proton would most likely take would be some kind of like outward spiral, okay? Um, now, again, notice that proton, or if this were an electron, it would go the opposite way. It would go clockwise. Um, uh, but in either case, there doesn't need to be a conductor there. This electric field exists, okay, as long as this magnetic flux in here is changing. And as long as that electric field exists, any charge you put in that region of space will experience a force. So that's a way to get um, to create a, 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 an electric force on an electric charge using a magnetic field. So again, big picture, we have a, an equation for Faraday's law that helps us calculate an electric field, and that electric field does affect things in space that around it. I hope that was uh, helpful, and um, thank you very much.